Okay, so for those of you that perhaps don't know me, uh, my name is Matt, and I've been with Church Street here for some time now. Uh, suffice to say, I'm practically part of the fabric of the church. Uh, for better or for worse, uh, and those who know me most can say for them what is worse, uh, including you, Ruth, Joe, Tim, and so on. Uh, I go to I, I work as a bookseller, um, sort of, I manage a bookshop. Uh, some of you will know that firsthand uh, to your uh, unfortunate misfortune, but here it, here it is. Uh, and that, oh, my, my, my. Just that blank slide would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> While Tim's doing that, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to go into a little bit of an introduction. Uh, to what we've been looking at so far. Tonight we're going to be in Mark's uh, Gospel, of course, that's been looking in for the past few weeks. We're looking at the latter part of chapter 4, and we'll be looking at a little bit of chapter 5. But, before then, let's have a little bit of a recap uh, of what we've looked at so far, for those of you who perhaps uh, missed some of those weeks, uh, and just in general, it's good to remind ourselves of what's going on so far. So, uh, week one, uh, Mark, in his kind of typical dramatic style of writing, kicks off his gospel with Jesus proclaiming right from the get-go his kingship and his coming kingdom. In Mark 1.14, Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand. It's happening. It is here through me. In Mark 2.10, Jesus says that he has come so that you may know that's the disciples and all those who listen to him, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. Authority on earth to forgive sins. Interesting thing about that verse. Twice, or in two different ways, Jesus again has this self-proclamation of his kingship. He calls himself the Son of Man. This is a term that Jesus uses of himself more than anything else. Uh, in the Gospels, and essentially he's claiming for himself the title of the second Adam, um, the person that's going to fulfill uh, God's covenant way back uh, in Genesis, the person that's going to fulfill all the prophets, prophecies that the Jews would be familiar with in the Old Testament. He is the Son of Man. And in the second part of that verse, he has authority to forgive sins. Again, this is showing something of Jesus' Messiah that he can forgive sins, or at least he declares that he can forgive sins. That was week one, Jesus' self-proclamation of his kingdom and of his kingship. And in the second week, we looked at how Jesus' ministry is word ministry, that everything that Jesus does in his ministry, he accomplishes through his spoken word. He calls disciples through his word, he says, follow me, and do. He heals the sick through his word, using phrases like, your sins are forgiven. It's all through Jesus' spoken words that the kingdom begins to come into fruition and as he begins his ministry in Mark. And then last week, when Tim was speaking, uh, we looked at a little bit at what Jesus' kingdom is actually like and how it grows and we were told, or rather we heard, how we need to listen carefully to the words of Jesus. Because it is the means by which we receive the gospel. We also saw in the par- parable of the mustard seed how Jesus' kingdom is radically different to anything that the Jews might have been <coughs> expecting. Uh, Jesus' kingdom was <coughs> topsy-turvy. It was a complete out of the blue notion to the Pharisees, to the disciples, to everybody. It was not like anything that they were expecting. This week we're going to see a continuation uh, in Mark's Gospel with the theme of Jesus' authority. We're going to see Jesus exert his authority or show his authority uh, with three miracles, with three different encounters. We're also going to see how people respond to Jesus' authority in each of these circumstances. But first, this is where the slideshow comes into play, Tim. First, let me tell you a story. So, some of you uh, may know that
that I go to a camp, a Christian camp, an SU camp, uh, called GS1. Thank you. <laughs> it's at Glenshi and it's held in the first week of summer. Hence, GS1. Does what it says in the tin. I'm sure you would appreciate that, Tim. Uh, and for years I've been going there as a leader. Now, uh, we study the Bible with the kids, or share the gospel with them. We share food with the kids. We share accommodation with the kids, which is sometimes a blessing and sometimes not. Uh, and we also share activities with the kids. Uh, one such activity you can see behind me is creek climbing. Now, as you maybe would, might guess, this particular activity engenders a fair bit of fear and trepidation amongst the kids, and, in my experience, amongst the leaders as well. Essentially, what you're doing, you have, you have one person here who is building a tower for themselves made of crates. And you see them harnessed in as well. The rest of their fellow teammates, their fellow campers, are holding on to the ropes that keep that to keep that person up in the air. There's also an instructor there to make sure that everything is safe. The idea is as the person is being handed the crates by their team, uh, they keep building the tower up and up and up and up to reach the top. The goal is to get to the top of the tower. But like I said, this comes with a fair amount of fear and anxiety for some kids, and understandably so. There's a lot of bad things that could happen. Crates could topple over and crush someone. It hasn't happened at camp yet, I don't think. Graham can maybe confirm, Graham's also a leader at the same camp. Uh, the ropes might slip in the, in the hands of people holding it, uh, sending you hurtling into the ground. Uh, you perhaps uh, you don't trust in your leaders or the instructor's abilities to keep you safe. Uh, and perhaps your fellow climbers might make fun of you, jeer at you if you actually can't manage it or if you're struggling throughout it. Uh, these are some things that all, every kid experiences a fear of at some point, or there's always a few kids that are afraid of a few of these things. But in order to overcome the activity, in order to get to the top or to do as best as you can, you need to address these fears. But how would you go about doing that? What would it take for you, if you imagine that you're this person, or perhaps the person in the next slide, <coughs> or even the person in the next slide? Um. What would it take for you to overcome your fears? I'm going to read from Proverbs before we get into our passage in Mark. Proverbs 1, verse 7. I'm going to read this and then I'm going to pray and then we'll get stuck in. Proverbs 1, verse 7 says this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Father God, as we come before your word in a moment, Lord, I pray uh, that the words I will speak the things that I have prepared, Lord, will bring you glory and will bring all of us to a deeper understanding and a deeper love for Jesus. I pray that what we are about to unpack will be a pleasing offering to your glory and to your honour. Yes, me. Amen. You can blank that slide out, not going to need that anymore. Thank you. So, Let's go now into Mark. We're in Mark chapter 4. Um, we'll that <coughs> and we're going to start from verse 35. So, uh, Jesus has just told a whole bunch of parables. We heard that from Tim last week. Parable of the sower, or the soils. Parable of the mustard seed, and a few others. Uh, and now, uh, you see Jesus still in Galilee, on the Sea of Galilee, that is. And uh, I'm going to see him do something few things that are very miraculous. But first, Jesus comes to stone. Verse 35 in chapter 4. We do it here. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, as the disciples, let us go across to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and leave the crowd, 
They took with them in the boats, just as he was, and other boats with them. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he, that is Jesus, was fast asleep in the stern on a cushion. They awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke, and he rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear, and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? We'll stop there before we move on. So a few things to note here in our passage before we can look, unpack it a little bit. In some versions of some translations, some commentators have uh, noted this. When you see the word great windstorm, some translations or some commentators would prefer to use the word squall. But in any case, um, this idea, this windstorm, this squall, in some ways is representing hostile forces to Jesus and his ministry. We're only four chapters, four and a bit chapters, uh, into Mark's gospel. Jesus is kind of just at the beginning, so to speak, of his ministry. Um, and so we could perhaps see something of the forces of evil of, that are hostile towards Jesus' ministry in uh, the furiousness, if that's a word, of the windstorm. As you read through, I don't know if you guys may <coughs> felt the same as the disciples, the astonishment that in the midst of an absolute rally, Jesus is fast asleep on a cushion. He's made all of Jesus' Scottish vernacular. Why do you think that is? I certainly ask that question. Why is Jesus so unaffected by the storm? Well, I think it's Mark's way of showing us Jesus' perfect unity with the Father, that he has complete trust in God's sovereignty over his creation. And since him and the Father are one, by extension, Jesus' authority over creation. And we see that authority in the very next bit. Jesus calms the storm with but a word. Again, playing into the theme of Jesus' ministry being word ministry. Jesus speaks and it is done. Just like that. Jesus does what only God can do. But who does that mean? Jesus. This is a question that the disciples have been even asked at the end of the passage. We don't quite get as far as answering that question, but at least at least they're they're interested. At least they're asking the question. Who is this man? And it's the question for us as well. As we go through. <coughs> Who is Jesus? As we go through again in verse 40, we see Jesus rebuking his disciples, commenting, or rather, um, forewarning their complete lack of faith. The disciples still don't really get who Jesus is. Instead, they are filled with fear at the power of the authority of this man <coughs> called Jesus. They haven't quite put two and two together of Jesus as a man, and yet he's commanded to the waves. He's done something only God can do. They haven't quite connected those dots yet, but we'll see more of that as we look through Mark's Gospel. So, why is any of this of particular importance to the disciples and to us? In this first miracle uh, from Jesus, there's more miracles to come, uh, we see Mark drawing a connection between Jesus and God in the fact that Jesus <coughs> shares the same authority and power that God does. <coughs> Several times in the Old Testament, there are stories of God's complete control over his creation, uh, and, all, and quite a few also involving water. Think of Jonah 1. Jonah is thrown into the sea amidst a furious storm, and God, in his sovereignty, sends a big fish, or a 
if you like, to swallow up Jonah to keep him safe. We see it in Psalm 89 and 107 as well, both describing God's complete control over his creation. We heard a little bit of it in uh, this morning, or at the beginning of this evening, in Psalm 46 as well. It's a common thing that Mark is playing on here. God is in control of his creation. But the new idea that he's showing us is that this man, Jesus, is God because he also has sovereign control and power and authority over creation. He's showing that Jesus is in fact the God of the Old Testament, the God that the disciples, most of whom were Jews, were familiar with. This and the next uh, passage that we're going to look at reveal Mark's purpose in showing that Jesus is the Messiah, is God's chosen King. That Jesus and God are one and the same because Jesus can do what only God can do. To bring it to us for a second, um, there's obviously classic uh, applications of when storms hit our boats, so to speak. How are we going to respond? The disciples' response is perhaps not the, not the best one to model. Uh, they respond with doubting anxiety of who is this man they've yet to see fully uh, who Jesus is. They've, they've yet to respond to Jesus with confident faith. Jesus is revealing, revealing to his disciples who he really is and in doing so, preparing them for ministry. But the disciples aren't ready yet. The coin hasn't dropped. And we'll see more of that in chapter 8 uh, with Tim in a few weeks' time. Um, a, new com- uh, a New Testament commentator uh, called James Edwards, none of you need to know who that is, I didn't know when I looked him up, so it's okay, says this that Jesus' self disclosure of his Messiah occurs in the presence of insiders <coughs> so that they may be able to hear, comprehend, and increase in faith. This is a big thing in Mark's Gospel about the building up of faith. It's the reason why he writes it at the very beginning. He says he's writing it so that you may increase in faith. Who Jesus is lays a claim on what the disciples may become. And it's the same for us. If Jesus is God's chosen king, that makes a difference to us. It makes a difference uh, to our salvation, whether or not we are saved, and it makes a difference post-salvation, how we then live our lives. To be more Christ-like or not, that is the question. Another uh, commentator I've heard, David Garland, writes this, There are no stormless seas. <coughs> all sailors, that's all of us, must learn to expect the unexpected. Chaos hits our lives, and it can happen so quickly. One moment all is well, and then in a flash, all is hell. So what are we to do? What are the disciples to do? In ministry, as in life, Jesus teaches us to expect the unexpected, and lean on Jesus' saving power and authority, or succumb to doubting anxiety. Let's read on to the next section and see what happens in Jesus' next encounter. This is chapter 5, and we're going to read from verses 1 to 20. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes, and when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, 
come out of the man, you unclean spirits. Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. He begged him earnestly not to send him out of the country. Now, a great herd of pigs was feeding on the hillside, and they, that is, Legion, begged him, saying, Send us into the pigs, let us, let us enter them. And so he gave them permission, uh, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and uh, the herd, numbering about 2,000, that's a whole lot of bacon, rushed the, the street back into the sea and drowned. What a waste, some of you may be thinking. The herdsmen fled and told uh, it in the city and in the country, and people came to see what, it, what had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had been possessed by the legion, sitting there, clothed, and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs, and they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you, of how he has had mercy on you. And he began, went away and began to proclaim to the Catholics how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. So, another interesting encounter for Jesus. No sooner is Jesus on dry land that he is accosted by a man who has been spending all his time in a gravesite, basically, so probably not the best of smells, and who has been mutilating himself with stones. So, probably not a pretty sight to be confronted with uh, right in your face. <coughs> Again, we can see potentially uh, some hint of a theme of hostility or hostile forces coming straight to Jesus in the form of this man, in the legion of demons that possess him. Jesus has been affronted by the hostile forces of nature and now he needs to be affronted by the hostile forces of Satan and his cohort. In verses 2 to 5, the man is described as having an unclean spirit and having lived among the tombs. So in other words, he is a complete outcast. He would have, would have had nothing to do with regular society on account of his possession and on account of the fact that he had been spending his time among the dead, which would defile him some more. If having the unclean spirit wasn't bad enough. The town is trying to bind him and chain him uh, which I guess goes to show the violent nature of this man's affliction. They're treating him like a wild <coughs> to no avail though. He spends his time wailing and mutilating himself. Mark is pretty explicit here again in his typical dramatic fashion. Pretty explicit that this man that Jesus comes across is in a desperate situation. He, his affliction is so great that it only goes to highlight, to emphasize the urgency with which he needs redemption through Jesus. Interestingly, in verse 6 to 7, the wee exchange that Jesus has with religion, it's obvious that the demons, the legion, know who Jesus is. They refer to him as the Son of the Most High God. Now, either this is showing reverence to who Jesus really was, or it's equally possible that they were making some kind of sarcastic comment. <coughs> Not really um, anything to that, I just thought it was a little bit interesting that this legion of demons knows who Jesus is, and yet the disciples who spent so much time with Jesus still hadn't quite figured it out. Odd. But anyway, immediately after this, though, the demons plead with Jesus. They're on their knees figuratively speaking, because it's a man that's on his knees. And they beg him to not be sent out of this region where they have power to stay in the region so that they can continue to do their work. They recognise
and uses his power and authority to utterly destroy them, which <coughs> is actually the reason that Jesus has come. The coming of God's kingdom spells destruction for Satan's kingdom and his cohort. But after Jesus sends the into the pigs, they are then drowned anyway. Again, Jesus is in complete control of the situation here. Even though the demons have been allowed to escape into some pigs, they're drowned in the sea. Jesus is completely in control of the situation. You may think, well, that's a bit unfair for the farmers eh, to have their 2,000 pair of pigs gone into the sea that are without their livelihood, so to speak. But I think the point that's not really addressed in Mark, and probably because of the fact that the redemption of one soul, at least to Mark, and I think most of us <coughs> agree, the redemption of one soul is far more important than the redemption of 2,000 pigs. So that's probably why it's not addressed, in case you were thinking, poor pigs, poor pig farmers. And another thing that we see, or continuing on, jumping to verse 15, what happens to the man, the, the demon-possessed man? What is the state that he is left in after the demons are ruined? Verse 15, if you read with me. He is clothed, sitting at Jesus' feet, clothed, and in his right mind. This is a complete turnover of fortune for the man. Mark gives here a clear picture of what discipleship and salvation look like. A restored individual sitting at the feet of Jesus. Again, David Garland says this, the most, those who are most open to receiving Jesus' power in their lives are those who recognise their own desperate need of it. At the beginning of this section, the man practically flings himself at Jesus in an act of desperation. He is desperate for Jesus. <coughs> those who are not open to his power are no less desperate, but have convinced themselves that they don't need it. I don't know if that might be some of us. At one time or another, I suppose that would be me. Yeah, a few times when I've struggled with pet sins and fears. Both the outer storm and the inner storms have been quelled by the authoritative word of Jesus. We can see the same thing in the next section. We're not going to have time to delve deep into it, so I'll try and summarise as best I can. In the next section, we've got two more encounters kind of sandwiched together. We have Jairus, a sinner <coughs> whose daughter is on the verge of death, and we have a nun named woman who is, has been suffering from a blood-related uh, illness for several years. No doctor, no physician has been able to relieve her from her suffering. Both come to Jesus, like the demon-possessed man, completely desperate. They are at a complete loss. All hope is almost lost for both of these individuals. And Mark, in his typically dramatic style, again, he's ramping up the tension, he's ramping up the stakes, um, where now someone's life, or two people's lives, are at stake. In both encounters, the afflicted persons, so Jairus' daughter and the sick woman, showcase, however, the very thing that Jesus has been challenging his disciples to, that is simple, dependent faith. Both come to Jesus in dire straits with a trust in Jesus' power and authority to relieve them from their situation. Jairus, foregoing perhaps any reputation that he may have had in coming direct to Jesus to bring his daughter back from the brink of death, the woman, uh, again, breaking all social norms, um, given her blood disorder, she was probably considered unclean uh, in society at the time. Being a woman didn't do you much favours. And so she, she is going completely out of bounds, 
for the culture and the society at that time, he even just tried to get close to Jesus to grab a hold of his garment to receive his healing power. <coughs> is what happens in the story. In particular, though, out of these two um, people, Mark highlights the woman as an exemplar of discipleship. Jesus says to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. It's the only time that Jesus refers to a woman in that way. Daughter. It's a deep and affectionate way of talking to somebody. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. <coughs> Note that Mark, as he's done in the previous passages, emphasizes faith. He emphasizes the faith of the woman. Not the fact that she touched Jesus and wrote a whole bunch of um, social, faux pas, social rules that are faux pas, but the fact that she had faith in his power to heal. We've seen Jesus command the hostile, command the hostile forces of nature and of Satan, and now we, in this section, if you read through it, uh, and hopefully you've seen it in my summary, uh, we've seen Jesus command sickness and even death. Well, I didn't mention, Jairus' daughter does actually come back to life, uh, even if uh, it was delayed. Uh, Jesus was delayed in getting to her. In fact, Jesus' authority over death is actually in each one of the encounters, if you think about it. On the boat in the middle of the storm, the disciples were fearing for their lives because the boat was about to be split in two and then along with it. The demon-possessed man was spending his entire time amongst dead people. There's an obvious theme of death. And probably, if Jesus hadn't intervened, would have stayed there for the rest of his life <coughs> and would have died there. <coughs> the woman has an incurable illness. And Jairus' daughter is in fact dead when Jesus gets to her. Death is a strong theme in all of these encounters. But in all of them, Jesus is in control, and Jesus has the authority and the power to overcome even death. The example of Moses is made even more poignant through Jairus' challenge to trust in Jesus' power to save his daughter, even when Jesus delays. And the challenge for Jairus, and for everybody who meets Jesus, which is all of us, is whether or not we are to believe in to believe in what only circumstance will allow, or to believe in the God who makes all things possible. So let's conclude and let's go back to camp for a little bit, back to GS1, back to that tower of crates. I asked the question at the beginning. Uh, you may remember, if not, that's okay. Let's we'll say it again. What would it take for you to overcome the fear of tackling the tower, of reaching the top? I hope in the passages that we've looked at and what I've spoken about that the obvious answer is trust, or as Mark would put it, faith. Trusting in the leaders. And, their, and instructors and their ability to keep you safe, trusting that the ropes are going to keep you aloft, trusting uh, that the crates are going to hold your weight and not topple, trusting uh, that your friends are going to be there to motivate you and encourage you as you climb. In many ways, the, what it takes to overcome the tower is also what it takes to overcome our fear and to start enjoying our discipleship, our disciplehood with our brother Jesus, with our Lord and Saviour. And it's the same challenge that the disciples faced, that Jairus faced, that the demon possessed man faced. It faces all of us. Jesus calls us to simple faith or trust. In his saving power, in the saving power of God's chosen king, in spite of fear. 
So, what remains for us, and what still remains for the disciples as we go through Mark, how are we going to respond to the authority of the King? Will we respond with confident faith, uh, like the unnamed woman, or will we respond with doubting anxiety, like the disciples so far? I'm going to read through two more passages. Um, you can do one of three things here. You could just listen as I read through. You could read through with me, if you like. Um, or, and I would really emphasise this one, think about that question. How are you going to respond to the authority of the Lord's <coughs> chosen king? So to end, Proverbs 3 Verses 5 to 8. It says this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. <coughs> And Romans 8, going from verse 31. It says this, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave them up for us all, how, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Is it God to justify? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us? From the love of Christ. Shall tribulations, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure. Paul's saying that, but I'm saying it as well. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels and nor demons, nor rulers rather, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray and pray for you, uh, for me and all of us, and then pray is going to lead us again more soon. <coughs> Father God, thank you for Jesus, for your chosen King, that in him, Lord, all fear melts away, that we can be confident in knowing the King, in knowing his power and authority and his love for us, that the King has in fact died for us, so that we would no longer live in fear, uh, but live in community with you, Father God. Thank you that that has been made possible by your Son, Jesus Christ. I pray as we go from here, uh, we will keep asking that question. How am I going to respond to the authority of Jesus Christ, to his power and authority to save and to heal? Let us never forget, uh, Lord, who you are, and let our trust in who you are never wane. Let us be continually confident in knowing the King and his power.